Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, so um, this is uh, um, about the joint work with um, a batch of students at Stanford, Yining Chen, Ananya Kumar, Colin Wei, and also Hai Peng Luo from USC, uh, Percy Liang, who is a faculty at Stanford, and Chi Cheng Dang, who is a faculty at uh, Arizona, uh, uh, University of Arizona. So uh, I'm going to talk about domain adaptation with theoretical guarantees. So uh, these uh, are two works uh, on domain adaptation uh, with some theory uh, about, about it. So I guess um, probably many of you have seen that um, one of the major challenge for applying domain, uh, machine learning systems to many uh, broader uh, machine learning applications is that there is a domain shift. And when there is a domain shift, the accuracy drops significantly. For example, suppose you collect your data and train your self-driving car with all of the data that are you know, sunny and, and you know, good weather. Uh, and then when you test your self-driving car on the road, uh, it rains. Then uh, the distribution of the testing environment is very different from the distribution in the training environment, then often the accuracy of the machine learning models can drop significantly. This poses a lot of you know, uh, challenges and the security or safety uh, risks uh, for the machine learning model. And this applies to many other case situations. For example, if you apply your machine learning model for, uh, for example, any risk sensitive you know, domains like healthcare, for example, uh, when you arrive uh, at a new hospital and apply your machine learning models, often accuracy drops a little bit compared to a training environment you are, um, you are, you are in. So uh, how do we address this domain adaptation? You know, I'm a theoretician, and these are two works on the theoretical aspect of domain adaptation. So um, I'm going to talk about two works. You know, one is about analyzing self-training for unsurprised domain adaptation, and the other is about you know, how do we learn uh, uh, new domains you know, actively by querying more labels you know, in an online uh, fashion. So I'm going to start with the unsupervised domain adaptation. So just to set up the uh, setting, so the setting is pretty classical. We have um, uh, some label examples from a source domain denoted by DS. Uh, here I'm having this SVH data set, which is a data data set. Um, and in your uh, target domain, the domain that you want to test on, so the target domain is very different. So here the target domain is the so-called MNIST, uh, and we only have unlabeled examples from the target domain denoted by DT. And you want to train you know, with these unlabeled examples from a target domain and labeled examples from the training domain, from the source domain, so that uh, you get best performance on a target domain. So the goal is to maximize the test accuracy on a target domain. So there are, um, you know, this question you know, has, a, has a long history. Right? So uh, I think maybe the earliest work is not, you know, but is, you know, is even like 50 years ago. So the classical theoretical work um, uh, a, one of them has been debated at all. This is a very seminal work that uh, lays the foundation of this you know, area. So the, uh, it says that suppose the training domain DS and the test distribution DT uh, are very similar under some uh, metric, this so-called H delta H metric. Um, so if they are, uh, they are similar, then a good accuracy on a source domain would mean a good accuracy on a target uh, distribution. So. Um, so in some sense, you know, suppose DS and DT are similar, the original theory of Ben David says that you don't have to do anything um, beyond just using the source data to train a classifier and then test on a target because the, the drop of the accuracy will be small as you expect it because the two distributions are similar. Uh, and this work has uh, you know, motivated a lot of heuristics to align the distribution of the source and target in a feature space just because in reality, the, uh, in the raw input space, the source distribution and target distribution are actually not very similar. So they have to apply different kind of techniques to, al to align the distribution of the source and target. And another uh, lab work is um, by Sugi Yama et al. 2017, uh, 27, 200, uh, 2007. So the idea is that you assume the covariant shift to so assume that the conditional distribution of y given x is the same uh, across source and target, and also assume that um, the, the distribution, the change of distribution is somewhat bounded. The, the target domain's um, uh, density is somewhat bounded by the source domain uh, in some sense. And then with this kind of bounded, the density ratio, you can do some important sampling. Uh, all of these works you know, often require that you, know, you have relatively small uh, shift measured by one way or the other, However, as I said, you know, in the empirical uh, settings, the domain shift often much larger. So this is a, a popular benchmark data set 
these states people are testing on. So it's called domain net. There are six domains and each line is, you know, uh, one of the domain here. So you have different kind of like, you know, classes uh, from each of the domain. And you can see that, for example, if you look at the first column, this is airplane in different domains. And you can see that, you know, different domains have very different kind of background, different kind of strokes, you know, different styles of images. And you certainly cannot expect that uh, two domains have shared support even. So they don't even have shared support. Certainly the differences between the domains are very are very big, at least in the raw input space in the, in the standard setting. Of course, you know, the domains are similar in other sense, for example, semantically, uh, they are similar. So the main thematic challenge for me is that, uh, in my opinion, is that um, we have to model this kind of domain shift from the source to target with realistic assumptions. Certainly you cannot assume that the shift from the source target is worst case, because if it's worst case, then you cannot get any guarantees uh, or even any results uh, from it. Uh, on the other hand, you cannot just assume that the source and target are just close uh, in some uh, metric like, you know, what's the same distance or, you know, IPM metrics so and so forth, just because they are not close in reality. So we have to have some realistic assumptions that captures the semantic relationship between the source and target. Uh, and, and, and so far we haven't seen much kind of assumptions, you know, that are amenable to a theoretical analysis. And this work is one of the, you know, first work in, um, for, as far as we know, to propose some more assumptions uh, uh, that we can, you know, uh, analyze, so, uh, under which we can analyze the domain shift from the source to the target. And assumptions here is, roughly speaking, target is more diverse than the source. Of course, this assumption is not always universally true, um, but you know, it's one of the settings that we can analyze. And also it's reasonably realistic as we will see uh, in a moment. And the algorithm we are going to analyze is the so-called self-training algorithm or pseudo-labeling algorithm. Um, if you, you know, are familiar with some of the empirical works, these are pretty popular algorithms that, are, uh, um, uh, that people are using these days in the last few years uh, for domain shift. Uh, and we are analyzing these algorithms. So just to elaborate on the, on the, the, the domain shift assumption, uh, the target and label data is more diverse. So the assumption we have is the following. So assume that input uh, X is consist, consists of two type of features, X1 and X2. Um, and X1 is the so-called signal feature. So this is the feature that uniquely uh, determine Y in both the source and target. So this is really the cause of the label. On the other hand, X2 uh, is the so-called spurious feature, meaning this is the feature that correlates with the Y in the source. So it spuriously correlates with Y. So you can use it to predict the Y in the source reasonably well, just because of the correlation. However, the spurious features is independent with Y in the target. So just to give you an example um, of the kind of the applications we are thinking in mind, for example, suppose you have this kind of images and a label is bird uh, and and certainly, you know, the background, you know, we are thinking the background is X2 because the background does sparsely correlate with the, the label because, you know, when you see bird, you do tend to see uh, uh, um, backgrounds like water or kind of like, you know, trees so and so forth. Um, um, but however, this is not the, the features that cause the, the label. You know, it's really the, the content of the bird, the shape and the color of the bird itself is causing um, the, the label of the bird. So, so the, the, the content is X1 and the background is X2. So this kind of spurious correlations, as you can see, uh, um, often uh, arises, you know, because, you know, all different kind of selection bias, you know, in the source or just naturally, you know, X1, um, the, the spurious features correlate uh, with the content of the image. And, and there could be other, you know, source of, you know, selection bias, you know, uh, and, and uh, however, we do want to, you know, remove these kind of like spurious features in a test because when you test on this, you know, maybe the, the features no longer exist or you want to be fair uh, 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 in, in the other sense. So, uh, and, and unlabeled target, because you have a lot of access to unlabeled, a large pool of unlabeled data, so they tend to be more diverse. For example, if you have, you know, look at all the online uh, 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 images, you know, uh, without any labels where you just look at, you know, all the web crowd uh, images, about bird, then certainly there is a more diverse set of birds with different kinds of backgrounds. You know, there are birds, you know, in all different kinds of backgrounds and you do want to do well for those kind of cases and you do have access to those unlabeled data, but you don't have labels for them. 
So uh, mathematically, you know, this is a theoretical work. We have to make you know, some simplifications. Mathematically, I guess, mainly we assume we have a linear model and we assume we have a binary classification. The y, the label is sampled from zero and one. And we don't make much assumptions on, on, the, on the source. The main assumption we make is on the target. We assume that there exists these two set of features, you know, two blocks of uh, coordinates of x, such that x1 uh, is independent with x2 condition y. And, 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 and actually, x2 is Gaussian uh, uh, in our assumption. So we have some spurious Gaussian feature. Uh, and, and also, we also assume that using x1 itself, we can predict y. And we assume a linear model, so y hat uh, is w transpose x. This is what we're going to learn. So ideally, we're going to learn a linear model that doesn't depend uh, on x2, but only depends on x1. So um, the algorithms we're going to analyze, uh, 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 we have two algorithms, one called self-training and the other called uh, entropy minimization. They are pretty much equivalent. Both of these two algorithms uh, use a learned classifier from the source. The, the mechanism of you know, uh, transferring knowledge from the source to target is via a learned classifier, a classifier learned from the source label data. We call it W source. So you, you just do some standard you know, uh, ERM training, like a, like a, a maximum like likelihood training on a source data, and you got this uh, source, classifier, source classifier called W source. And then uh, in a pseudo labeling or self training algorithm, what you do is the following. So recall that we only have unlabeled data. What you do is you say, you're gonna label all the target unlabeled data Xi by the current classifier W transpose Xi. So W source is your initialization. You initialize W by W source and then you label using your, uh, uh, using your current classifier, the unlabeled data. So you get these unlabels, uh, this unlabeled data uh, so you get these pseudo labels called Y pseudo uh, superscript I. So this is a pseudo label of your target unlabeled data. And then you just pretend that this is actually the true label. Um, so you just train on uh, uh, XI and YI uh, pseudo label. So, um, so, and then what you do is you say, you, you, you go back to say, I'm going to, um, because you train on the pseudo label, you go, um, uh, you change your classifier a little bit, and then you go back to relabel your example again, and you do this, you know, repeatedly. I think I'm missing here uh, a, a sign here, right? So when you label this, you do label with, you know, plus minus one. So you do take a sign of W transpose XI to label uh, the YI. So that's why you are not going to st stack at the same W because after you do the uh, uh, nonlinear transformation, you are going to uh, make the label plus one minus one. And then when you retrain, you are going to change your classifier a little bit. And then you go back to uh, relabel your unlabeled examples again. So this is called pseudo labeling or self training. And another uh, more or less equivalent algorithm, which I'm going to argue uh, is uh, this entropy minimization. So um, recall that you know, the, the model entails uh, a distribution of y given x, right? So y given x is actually the Bernoulli distribution of the uh, sigmoid of W transpose x. This is the standard logistic regression model. So, uh, so y given x is a Bernoulli distribution. You can define its entropy. Uh, and you can also compute the entropy of all the y given x given uh, 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 on the target uh, uh, data set. So basically, you take the sum over all the target examples all the target unlabeled examples, and you compute the Bernoulli distribution, and then you compute the entropy of this Bernoulli distribution, right? So, um, and because this is really just you know this entropy Bernoulli sigma W transpose Xi, if you just expand this out using some elementary uh, calculation, this is really just a function of W transpose Xi, and actually you can verify that this is. Uh, actually symmetric with respect to W transpose Xi, because if you flip the probability of the two labels, uh, actually you get the same entropy. So that's why this is a sum of uh, some function of the absolute value of W transpose Xi. And this function L is pretty much just a logistic function. So uh, this is really just the log of one plus exponential minus T, which looks like uh, some linear function on the negative side and then uh, extrapolates to some exponential function on the right hand side. Um, I guess I do see some questions. Are this, um, uh, Jens, am I supposed to answer questions right now or like, uh, uh, what should I do? Uh, so, so either way is fine, I guess. Um, maybe we, we have enough time for questions um, because, uh, so, so you can, you can take it at the end. Okay. We also so, have uh, questions from uh, Billy Billy actually. 
after that, uh, I, I will read it for you. Okay, so just feel, uh, I guess uh, I, I probably will answer this question right now and uh, feel free to just interrupt me uh, if you find some question that I should answer. Um, because I, I think it's probably hard for me to monitor all the questions, so may, I may miss something. So, so I guess for this, this question, concrete, what does it mean by the target is more diverse than the source? Uh, does self-training tend to get stuck at the local minimum instead of a global minimum? So the qu first question, you know, I guess I, I, I saw the question pretty late. So we've, I've defined the, uh, the what diverse means for us. You know, it's very uh, special definition of diverse. We just mean that um, some spurious features doesn't correlate with the label uh, anymore in a target. Uh, this is just a very special type definition of diversity. You know, we probably have, can come up with other definition of diversity. Uh, and regarding whether self-training gets stuck at a local minimum, so, uh, or instead of a global minimum, we do have some results for some special cases where you can converge to a global minimum, like a mixture of Gaussians. But generally, uh, the main point of this work is not to talk about how uh, how the uh, uh, computational uh, how the computational aspect work. So we mostly care about why the objective itself uh, it makes sense. I hope that answers the question. So um, I guess, um, so, um, okay, so I guess, you know, uh, as I said, this entropy loss is basically just the loss function of the absolute value of W transpose X hat. This is very different from, you know, this is different from the standard supervised learning because when you have supervised learning, what you have is loss of W transpose X hat times Y, the label Y is in it, and there's no absolute value. So here, because you don't have any labels uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the target domain, so you do have to use some, that's why we have absolute value here in some sense. So in some sense, this is really just the maximizing the unsparse margin, right? Your margin is not defined with respect to a label. Your margin is really the absolute value of the of the of the output of the model. So uh, and maybe uh, you, as you can see, you know, this is actually these two algorithm actually in some sense very equivalent, almost equivalent. So both of them can be viewed as the following. So if you insert another minimization. Uh, 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 um, uh, minimizing over the pseudo labels minus one plus one, and then you minimize uh, your loss function with respect to pseudo labels. Then um, you can see this objective is almost the same thing uh, uh, for both of the uh, the two algorithms, right? So for on, the, on the right hand side, you know, the, to to link it to the right hand side. So basically, what you do is you just remove the the minimization because the minimizer of the pseudo label is pretty much unique. It's just the the, the sign of W transpose X sign. And that's how you derive the entropy minimization. And basically, the left hand side is just the you know as alternate minimization of this, right? You you each time you decide y i, and then you minimize over w, and then you minimize over y y pseudo uh, p s y i, right? So um, so these two algorithms are almost the same. So basically, we just analyze one of them. It's called the entropy minimization. And the reason why we care about these two algorithms is that um, these two algorithms have uh, a tremendous empirical success on ImageNet. Um, this is uh, by one of the recent paper. Uh, they show that if you do self-training on a diverse, you know, 300 million unlabeled data pool, uh, um, this is the uh, work done by Google. So they have a lot of exercise to access to unlabeled examples. They just uh, self-trained on this unlabeled 300 million data set, and they show that uh, the, the, the robustness of the model improves dramatically. So they test on different kind of like harder image net data set. So image net A, B, C, so on and so forth. So these are uh, uh, pretty hard, uh, that were uh, pretty hard data set with, you know, uh, different kind of like, uh, um, um, you know, they are hand selected, you know, hard instances of image net. Uh, and they found that the, the self training improved the robustness. Okay. Um, okay, sounds good. So I guess the main theorem we can prove is the following. So uh, we do have a one additional assumption uh, before stating the theorem. So the additional assumption is that uh, we have so far we haven't started talk about anything about x one, right? So x one is just a signal feature. We haven't assumed anything. Uh, what we have to assume is that x one is a mix of well separated log concave and log smooth distributions. So in some sense, this you know, separation. Uh, ensuring separation uh, across classes, and also this to ensure some continuity within the classes. In some sense, this is an unsupervised definition, uh, so that you do have a clear definition, clear you know, separation between the clusters of uh, uh, of each classes, so that you can uh, leverage the uh, the unsupervised data. 
Uh, and also, we, we, in the paper, we show that some separation and continuity assumptions are necessary. If you remove any of these assumptions, then uh, the, the statement is no longer true. And the, what the statement we have is the following. So suppose you start with a decent source classifier. We suppose you start from a source classifier that has a decent accuracy. Then if you have polynomial number of unlabeled data, um, uh, self-training on the pseudo labels will converge to a solution that does not use the spurious features X2. So in other words, this converges to the minimum no entropy solution that only uses X1. So, so by self-training, you remove the dependencies on X2, even though your source classifier may depend on X2 uh, 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 to start with, but you do remove the dependency on X2 after self-training. So I guess just to you know, illustrate this, you know, uh, you know, for a special case, uh, uh, where X1 is a mixture of Gaussians. So actually for this case, we can also prove stronger statements showing that X1 uh, a self training can converge to the various optimal classifier. So um, uh, as we you know, discussed, you know, we don't have much assumptions on the source, class, uh, the source data distribution. So let's assume that X1, the, uh, the X axis here is the, is the signal feature and the, 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 the vertical axis is the spurious feature. Right, so and the source class in the source classifier, indeed, uh, the first feature correlates with the with the uh, the label. Uh, so that's why when you learn on the source classifier here, um, so here triangle means you know plus you know uh, circle means you know negative examples. Then you do learn a classifier that does use the first features and also the signal feature together. Right, so this is the optimal source classifier. Uh, um, and however, when you have the Target data set, the unlabeled target data set, the unlabeled target data set doesn't have any, you know, uh, 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 the, the spurious features that is independent with the label in the unlabeled data set, right? So, uh, and so you have this kind of more, um, so, so basically the spurious features don't tell you anything about the label in the unlabeled data set. And you have this kind of configuration, but here you don't have any labels. And you start from the source trend classifier, and now you start to minimize the entropy on the target data set. And to, what end up happening is that uh, uh, we learn a classifier that doesn't use the superus feature. We only use the signal feature X1. And actually we can prove a little bit stronger result. We can show that there is no bi local minimum, so and so forth, and polynomial sample complexity. So self-training uh, unlabeled data converted to the base optimal classifier in this case. So um, let me talk about a little bit about like uh, the uh, the proof sketch. This is a, a, a theoretical work, so I just have one one slide for this. So recall that the goal is to show that we are not going to use the spurious features, right? So how do you show that? Basically, you show that if you avoid using the spurious features, you are going to reduce the entropy, right? So what is the entropy? The entropy is basically, as I said, uh, this loss function uh, on the absolute value of W transpose X. So um, the loss function, um, and if you look at the loss function, um, W transpose X is equal to W1 transpose X1 plus W2 transpose X2. Um, and our goal is to show that if you don't use any W2, suppose you set W2 to be zero, then this loss function will be decreased. And that's how you show that you don't want to use W2 at all, right, eventually. So here's a failed attempt, you know, which is actually a natural first, you know, attempt that we have tried. So we thought that, you know, maybe, even if you fix W1 and you fix X1, right? You, you, uh, you, for any X W1 and any X1, uh, if you set W2 to be zero, then this reduces the entropy. And it turns out that this is not entirely true. So because, uh, so this is what we want to prove. We want to prove that if you condition on X1, you can still reduce your entropy by making W2 zero. And if this is true, then even if you don't condition X1, you still um, prove it. However, this is not entirely true because if you, happen to be in a situation that W1 transpose X1, which we denote by mu, is equal to zero. Then the left-hand side is basically the loss of W2 transpose X2. And the right-hand side is the L of zero. And L of zero you know, uh, is a constant. So, but here, recall that this loss function is actually a decreasing function as you, uh, uh, as you become bigger and bigger. So any possible choice of W2 actually make uh, uh, the laws are uh, 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 smaller. So, so actually, um, wait, so I think I'm, maybe I, did I mess up something here? I guess I, I think I messed up the, 
the inequality here. Maybe let me just uh, do it. Uh, just, this, this seems to be pretty serious. So sorry. Um, so 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 we want to show that you know if you make w two to be zero, then uh, your your entropy becomes becomes smaller. But actually, uh, here any choi bigger choice of w two will make the entropy smaller, just because l zero is bigger than any of the l. Uh, you know, if you plug in a positive number in L, you always make the 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 the, the entropy smaller. So so you do want to have like a bigger W in this case. So um, so the way that we fix this is by showing that actually this cannot happen for many of the x ones. It's not uh, uh, um, so for it's not possible that W one transpose x one is always zero for every x one. So for some x one, indeed, it's true that you want to reduce uh the 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 you want to kind of like increase the reliance on the spurious features and by some of the x, other x1 uh you want to reduce the reliance on the spurious features and if you carefully balance these two then you will show that um actually overall it's still better to not use the spurious features um um eventually so uh so basically we show that you know it's not possible that uh w1 transpose x1 mu uh is small um, because of the separation and continuity, right? Because you have some separation and continuity within the class, um, then uh, you cannot always, you know, uh, W1 transpose X1 cannot always center around zero um, uh, in this bad case. So that's that's pre pretty much the, the proof sketch. So I guess the, just the one uh, uh, note is that uh, this is not entirely trivial just because, um, so, so one of the, the common kind of like first impression, you know, including me, you know, when I first think about this, I thought this is trivial because I thought that, you know, if your spurious feature is not useful, why your classifier wants to, see it, wants to use it? It sounds like entirely trivial to uh, not ignoring the classifier. However, the, the problem here is that you don't have labels, right? So we only assume that the spurious features is independent with the target label, but we don't have any access to the label. So you don't really know uh, uh, the spurious features is not useful if you don't see the label. So, but however, self-training can let you to uh, do that without even access to the label, which is the, uh, the reason why this is interesting. Um, let me um, briefly talk about some of the experiments that we use to verify uh, some of these theoretical findings, which I feel like pretty interesting as well. So, um, um, so the, the theory says that you know when the target is more diverse, you somehow uh, remove the spurious correlation from your uh, from a model from your model, and that's the main thing we want to kind of like uh, uh, test. So, um, so we have a uh, two setup. You know, um, both are synthetic. So one setup is that you say the source domain. Um, like this so-called color analyst. So the, the main signal feature is the shape and the spurious feature is the color. Uh, in the source domain, you do have these spurious correlations, right? So, um, um, so the color does indicate what the label is. And in the target domain, you have zero correlation between the color and the, uh, and the label. So I think in the source domain, I think uh, the odd number tends to have a, a more, uh, more um, like a green color and the uh, the, the even number tends to have um, um, a warm color. So, um, and another setting we have is the following. So we have this lab A data set where we let the spurious features to be the blondness uh, of the hair and the target is the gender. So you want to predict the gender and we just did design this uh, synthetic data set where in the source data set, you can see that you can basically tell the gender from the hair color. This is a very you know, high, uh, uh, artificial data set which you know, we selected you know, ourselves just to demonstrate the effect. So you can see that if you see black color, then basically um, uh, the, the image is about a woman. And uh, if you see blonde color, then it's a male. So and in the target domain, this is more diverse. We just you know, collect you know, a random data uh, uh, from the celebrated data set. Uh, and with a little bit of post-processing. So different color can associate with you know, both the gender uh, and and if you train on the source and you test on the target, you're going to lose a lot of accuracy. So, however, if you do self-training, you can you can recover the accuracy. So, so here is the uh, some some uh, the first thing we did is to look at the accuracy and see whether self-training indeed improves. Right? You can see the first row is that uh, what if we do we just train on the source, right? So, and the second row is after we do self-training on the target, and we can see that the performance. Uh, generally improves, and indeed the improvement does depend on how uh, how good the, the source accuracy is. Right? So here we have this additional parameter called P, which I didn't define. So P is the, the strength of the correlation 
uh, between the color and the, the shape in, in the color MNIST. Right? So P is 0.95 means you have a 0.9 correlation. Um, P is 0.97 means you have a 0.97 correlation. And you can see that for color MNIST, uh, uh, 10 or two, these are 10 labels. So two labels, we do see improvements uh, when P is 0.95, but when P is 0.97, in the last column, we see the drop of performance. And this indicates that our assumption that a source color has, the source color sphere has to be this reasonable uh, is needed. So what happens here basically is that because the P is so high, the P is 0.97, um, so the correlation between spurious feature and the source and the label is too high. So actually in the source classifier, you just purely rely on the spurious features. Um, so there's no any knowledge you can gain from the source classifier. That's why self-training doesn't really help. And we also try to see what are the, uh, whether the, it's indeed true that uh, the self-training reduced the, alliance, uh, the reliance on spurious features. So what we do is we say, we look at what are the examples that are corrected by the, uh, by the self-training. I have convinced you that you know, before that uh, the, the, the accuracy is improved when you uh, do self-training. So we can see, we want to see that gap, the differences between the accuracies uh, comes from which kind of examples. And, and here, you know, I'm basically have a random sampling of the, uh, the, the correct examples for, by self-training. So there's like, I think for the saliva, there's a 7% differences. We just sampled from the 7% of examples and see what are, there, are those examples. And you can see here, basically, these are all examples where the correlation goes in our goes in the other way uh, uh, than the source source domain, right? So here the, the women have a uh, um, yellow color, so which is not the same as in the source domain, the source domain, all the women have dark um, uh, black color, um, black, black hairs. And that's why they are misclassified by the source classifier because they don't you know, uh, have the same correlation. However, after you do the self-training, uh, this you know, uh, women got you know, correctly classified again, just because the self-training reduce the reliance on the, on the higher color, the spurious feature. And they are using, uh, the, the classifier starts to use you know, other features to classify the gender. And the same thing happens for um, some of the, the male instances where, where they have like dark color. And if you use the correlation, you are gonna classify them as female. However, if you remove this co correlation, then you're gonna, you're gonna correctly classify them. So, um, I guess uh, this is uh, pretty much you know the first part of the talk. So where I the main focus was about like uh, uh, analyzing self training for unsupervised domain adaptation. And the second part will be a little bit shorter. So I'm going to talk about you know what happens if you have a you know a sequential domain shift and and the shift potentially can be very big. So you really have to rely on some active uh, labeling techniques to get more data to train better. So this is more closer to online learning because we are thinking about a gradual domain shift. Right, so the, the motivation is that the data distribution can shift over time, and you know you, um, you know, and and, and the data distribution can shift too large so that you know at some point your self training techniques may not and uh, work anymore. Right, so uh, the accuracy degrade over time. So uh, one option, you know, is you just use self training techniques we have de de described before to gradually self train, um, and and it, the actually we have a paper on this, and the point is that uh, you have to self train iteratively instead of only self train on a target from the source. So you do have to uh, iteratively use all your uh, timestamps to self train to maintain the accuracy to some extent. But still, if you have you know, a very, very long sequence of you know, domain shift, the accuracy will finally degrade, even though it degrades you know, slower than just uh, doing other techniques. So in, the, in this kind of hard cases where the, 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 the domain shift is too big and there's no any other ways to deal with them, uh, you know, in my opinion, probably you just have to collect more label data um, uh, so that you can reach your classifier to adapt to the new uh, domain. So, however, the main thing here is that how do you collect data efficiently? You cannot afford to collect data for every time steps. Um, so, um, so ideally, we want to say that the number of data points we collect is sublinear in the time steps so that we can afford to collect some data in the future. And we do have to do this cleverly so that we don't have to collect repeated data. For example, if the domain didn't shift uh, uh, eventually, so then we don't want to collect all those data. So, um, so I guess probably this reminds you, uh, especially if you're a theoretician, this reminds you uh, of the online learning setup, which is actually a classical framework for handling worst case data shift, just because um, 
uh, the data shift uh, could be uh, uh, so so online learning can handle adversarial even adversarial data uh, data points. So um, the idea is that uh, um, the online learning framework is that at time step t, uh, your input x t is reviewed, and as a learner, you have to predict y t and suffer some loss, and then the label is provided to you. So. Um, so um, the, the problem is that the labels are pretty expensive. Um, so you do have to, uh, if, you, if you get this label YT you know, every time, then it could be pretty uh, complicated. So uh, it could be pretty expensive. And we cannot afford to collect labels you know, every time. Um, so, um, and the, the way that we do it this, this is that, you know, uh, one of the way to formalize this is that you, you probably want to consider how many labels you get uh, from online learning. This is so-called label efficient online learning or active online learning. So um, the, the idea is that you say, no, I, I don't take it granted. I don't take it for granted that the label is revealed to me. Uh, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to query the label or not. So sometimes I may create a label, sometimes I may just say, I'm going to save the budget, I'm not going to uh, do the cross-sourcing. Um, so, and now there are two evaluation metrics because you have to have, do have to consider how many labels you query. Um, and uh, so there's two uh, metrics, one is the regret, uh, the total regret, and the other is the number of labels queried uh, on in, in, uh, from time one to time t, which we denote by q. So we care about the trade-off between the regret uh, and, and the label. So uh, the interesting thing here is that um, if you assume arbitrary xt uh, uh, as usual as in online learning, then actually that's too pessimistic for any intelligent uh, algorithms to query the label. So, so here is a, a simple demonstration. So if you have linear regression in dimension d for simplicity, then if you have full queries, then that's pretty trivial. So you know the regret is bounded by D up to log factors and the query is T. Um, you just query all the examples. And the best algorithm turns out to be that you just query randomly with some probability beta. Um, so the regret, the, the, the budget or the number of queries you have is beta times T in expectation. And the regret is just gonna be D over beta. You lose a factor beta uh, in a regret. And it turned out that this is the optimal thing to do for um, not only just linear models, but for any actual linear. Uh, non, most of the nonlinear models, this is still true. So, or even classification or other kind of like expert problems. So, and this is minimax optimal just because that you're assuming that the XTs can be worst case. Um, so that's why there's no any kind of intelligent way to decide what are uh, uh, which examples to query or not, because all the examples could be super difficult in the worst case, and you just have to query them. Or if you cannot query all of them, you just have to randomly select some subset uh, as the random queries do. So, so the more interesting thing is that um, what. Uh, how can you have an interesting algorithm? And one of the possible possibility is that the data is more structured. So that you do have some you know, simple examples, you do have some target examples, and then you can decide which examples to query. And the labels could be uh, clever in terms of query the, easy, the hard examples instead of the easy examples. So, so here's a way to model this. So you assume that the data come from a mixture of domains, d1 up to dk, potentially you know, with some interleaving. So, uh, and, uh, and each domain is actually simple. So every domain, for example, in the linear case, we assume every domain resides in subspace uh, of dimension di and has some ti examples. So every domain is a simple domain and, uh, and, uh, and they come in some kind of like a rough order. Um, so, and d and t are not known to the algorithm. So th then the algorithm needs to uh, have, we want the algorithm have some better trade-off between the regret and the queries. And the reason why this is possible is because the heterogeneity here allows you to make some clever decisions. For example, if some domain has very low dimension, then you probably don't want to query that domain uh, that many times just because that domain is easier, right? The dimensionality is easier. So maybe with a few examples, you already know everything about that domain, so you don't have to query anymore. However, for some other domains where the DI and the T are big, then maybe you want to query uh, more examples. And this is exactly what we do um, pretty much. So we have this algorithm so-called uh, query in the face of uncertainty Q4. So basically the algorithm has two steps. 
First, you want to estimate uncertainty of the current model. Uh, we compute some so-called delta t, an upper bound of the required RT at time t. So, um, and uh, for linear models, this is doable. Analytical formula for linear models exist. It's pretty much just the, the new example xt measured under some inverse covariance of the past data. And then you query with probability delta t. So, um, so you just query um, proportional to the uncertainty uh, of your uh, example. And that's the algorithm. And the theorem is also very simple. So suppose DI is the dimensionality, the linear, the, the rank of the span of the domain I, then Q4 achieves the following trade-off between the queries and the, the regret. So the number of queries is beta times T, and the regret is going to be the sum of DI TI square root, and then take the square, and then over beta. And as you can recall that if you have uniform queries, then Q is equal to beta T and R is equal to D over beta. So the question is whether the sum of square root DI TI square is less than D or not. And when, and this is, you know, in general, um, uh, our bound is, you know, up to constant factor at, le at most D, just because, you know, you do a Cauchy-Schwarz. Uh, and this Cauchy-Schwarz is not always tight, you know, when the data are heterogeneous, right? So there are some example, some domains with a lot of data, but with, you know, probably uh, 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 a very large dimension and some other domains with, you know, very small dimension, um, so and so forth, right? So when this Cauchy-Schwarz is not tight, then we have a better bound. So, so in some sense, our bound is more customized to heterogeneous settings where you have you know, a variety of different dimensionality and different time span of domains. So I guess I'm running out of time. I'm going to uh, skip the proof sketch, which is pretty simple. You just uh, write down some very simple inequality and uh, um, of the regret queries. And then um, the only thing we, we need basically is this uh, the force bullet. So you need a sum total bound on the number of the sum of DLT um, this is basically the elliptical potential line minor linear bandit, and then you do some linear algebra and you get it. So we have some experiments as well. We, we compare with uniform queries and greedy queries where you just query from the beginning, and you can see that we can do better uh, than both of the cases. We can do much better than greedy, mostly because the greedy there is a domain shift. The, the greedy algorithm only query the beginning of the uh, uh, the, the sequence, so it doesn't really work well for the rest of the sequences because domain shifts. Um, so um, I guess um, just to recap very quickly, so the part has two parts, the talk has two parts, self-training with pseudo-labels pseudo can avoid using spurious features. Um, that's the first part of the talk. Uh, and the second part, uh, we talk about how do we, uh, uh, how do we, uh, design algorithms that, that can query uh, examples cleverly. You know, so the, the principle we have is that we want to uh, query more often the uncertain examples in online domain adaptation. I guess the obvious question, the obvious open questions are that how do we deal with nonlinear models in both of these settings? So in both of these cases, the main theory are for linear models. Uh, for the second part, we do have some theory for nonlinear models, but relatively weak. So the question uh, is how do we extend this to nonlinear models? And, and the, the kind of challenge for the first part is that for nonlinear models, it's very hard to uh, deal with the, uh, uh, so it's very hard to compute some of this entropy term. Uh, it's not as easy as to as in the linear case where you have analytical formulas for everything. The same thing pretty much happens for the second case as well. So for uh, for that certain quantification, linear models give us this you know precise. Uh, 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 upper bound delta t of this precise analytical form. And if you have nonlinear models, it's much harder. So we do have some way to do, do that with a weak guarantee, but it's certainly probably not optimal. OK, I guess I'm running out of time a little bit. Thank you very much. OK, thanks for the nice talk. So so I have a, one question. So uh, so it seems that the, the, the first part of the talk is very uh, related to this semi-supervised learning. They also have this self-training. So, uh, so can you elaborate what's the relation or any other like theoretical result for semi-supervised learning there? Yeah, so yes, that's, 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 a, that's a great question. So uh, the question is, uh, how does this relate to using self-training for semi-supervised learning? So uh, uh, you are indeed correct. That, um, it's, um, it's also very typical to use 
self training on semi supervised learning, which means that you just uh, the target domain is exactly the same as the source domain, and mm -hmm. basically in that case you just have a lot of unlabeled examples. So our theory cannot explain why you can get better um, performance there. Um, um, so in some sense, our theory is more tailored to a change of domains. Um, for semi supervised learning, I my belief is that self training still works, and the reason why it works is probably a little bit different. So basically you have this, uh, this entropy minimization term. This entropy minimization term seems to also uh, impose some additional constraints on the hypothesis class. So, so basically when you do self semi supervised learning um, with these two parts of the laws, basically you are saying that I need to fit my label, but also I want unsupervised margin, large unsupervised margin model. It's kind of like a transductive SVM uh, for linear case. So, um, and transductive SVM for some reason, even though it's kind of like 25 years old, um, proposed by Vapnik, probably 1995, something like that. Still, I think there are very little, there's very little theoretical work on explaining why um, the additional constraint can improve the sample uh, complexity. But I do feel like probably the principle is, 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 um, is really like, a, more or less you just constrain the hypothesis class in some way, but it's very hard to characterize in what sense you are making the hypothesis class smaller. But I, I think none of this is, has anything to do with our uh, approach. We are really focusing on the, the, the domain shift. So for us, sample complexity is really like, uh, as long as polynomial in D is fine. Okay. So uh, another question is that, that why, why you need this uh, separability kind of uh, assumption to achieve, to achieve your result? So I think, let me see whether I have anything more than what I already said. So, um, so in a worst case, you know, in a very, very worst case, you do need separability. For example, suppose this is a mixture of Gaussian case. Suppose your target data is just a, a single Gaussian, a spherical Gaussian, right? Mm -hmm. right just a, a single spherical Gaussian centered around zero. I think it's kind of hard to assume that it's hard to expect that self training can work and work at all, right? So, uh, just because um, so 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 it's how completely hard would it want to be? Uh, I mean, I mean, there, there are kind of uh, uh, so several separability assumptions on Gaussian mixture learning. So there are also maybe other like like linear separable assumption. So what exactly? Is your assumption? Do you really allow some overlap or no overlap at all? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's also a great question. So I think technically we didn't really. Um, so what's exactly the separable separable assumptions? I think we the basically the separable assumption for us is to we basically assume that the 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 um, the minimum entropy solution on the target can be small. So you do have a classifier that can achieve a small entropy. So, so which basically means that you do have a classifier with you know, a relatively large separation. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily think this is, we didn't compare it with the existing Gaussian mixture separability. I think probably it's stronger than uh, the existing Gaussian mixture uh, separability. So, so, so under our assumption, I think it's probably true that you can just learn the two Gaussian, two mix of Gaussian. Um, um, and, and you know, and, and probably perfect separate. So um, you know, we, we of course we don't know we don't need exact separation. That that's definitely we, not something we need. But probably stronger than the existing uh, mix of Gaussian separation. But on the other hand, you know, um, we also allow other separations. You know, even they are not Gaussian. So the only thing we need about separation is to assume that there exists a classifier with small enough entropy. I see. I see. So uh, there's also another question from uh, Billy Billy. Let me read it for you. Uh, uh, so what is the statistical evaluation metric for domain adapter, for domain adaptation? What is the metric? Uh, I, I think the metric is pretty much the, you know, I, I think this is a open-ended question. Like, I mean, uh, you can design your own metric, but the typical metric is probably just uh, uh, the accuracy on the target domain. 
Uh, and of course, there are other kind of like statistics you care about how many examples you use from the target domain, how many target exam how many labeled examples you use, and how many unlabeled examples you use from the target domain. Uh, but generally, just the accuracy on the target domain. Okay. So, so any other questions from, for example, this uh, Zoom room? So, uh, so if there are no further questions, uh, so let's thanks to you again. For the thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for listening. Okay.